the truth sets you free. With the world's fastest reader, Howard Steven Berg. Hey everyone, Howard Berg, world's fastest reader. Welcome back to another show. Today we have a wonderful guest, a wonderful show. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, to begin with, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Gloria, Gloria Cowan, Journey Through the Bible. She's a um, Bible teacher at the Baptist Church. And I think it's in Cedar, here it is, Cedar Hill. And uh, Gloria has a wonderful program, wonderful classes. Dr. Sugg highly recommends her. That's our other sponsor. And I've created a website just for Gloria, GloriaCowan.com. And so if you missed one of her sermons or one of her classes, she doesn't call it a sermon, she calls it one of her classes, uh, you could go online and watch the whole thing. And I've set it up for you, and it's, oh, there must be about 30, 35 class, uh, lessons there. And it's uh, all correlated and collated, and it's sequential, and I think you'll enjoy it. I made a nice website just for her. Now, I wanted to give you a quick learning tip for our guest, Lori Van, who's going to cover a very important subject today. And <clears throat> I was going to use her book to show you one of the first things you want to do to speed up. First, you, you kind of flip through the pages, so the pages are loose. Open up, take your hand, and just quickly go through the book, up, back and forth and down, back and forth and down. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to see what's in the book. So here I see a table of contents, and here I see there's an introduction. Okay, and as I'm going through this, I'm looking to see the structure of the book. She has a lot of bullets. This is the reason why she wrote the book. This is her professional background and different trends that are important and why it's important to know what she's doing and different warnings and regulations. And now we're in the first chapter. So that's kind of the introduction. And then I continue and I look to see there's bullets, there's bolds, there's, there's italics. <clears throat> she's using columns and, and she's using numbering. So what I'm doing is I'm learning about the book. You might say, why would you want to do that? Did you ever get in a book, and at the end of the book, there was an appendix? And it would have been very helpful when you were in chapter three. You didn't know it was there. We read like we were in third grade. We read the first page, the first paragraph, the first sentence, the first word. If there's something further on that could help you, you won't know till you get there. And so even though you need it right now, you won't know it's available. But if you do what I'm showing you, you know it's coming before you even get to it. And then when you need it, you can go to it quickly. And that will help you learn anything faster and better. And speaking of becoming better, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Lori, Lori Van. Tell us a little about you and what you do. Well, I'm a licensed professional counselor, supervisor in Carrollton. I'm in a private practice. Uh, I'm also a professional speaker and have spoken throughout uh, the U.S. And, and Mexico on a variety of topics and uh, author of three books with number four coming out in the summer uh, and they're available on Amazon and also on my website on LoriVanCounseling.com. Uh, and uh, let's see what else and my interns provide low-cost counseling services because I don't believe mental health should be a luxury item. I, I admire that because not everyone in the health field is as concerned about the financial status yes. of their client. If you can't afford me, then you can't have me. Yes. You know, and that's, that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. the people who need the most help often have the least. Yes. So that's very nice. Um, tell us a little about the certification. We were talking right before... We started and said in Texas there's different kinds of certification. So I'm a licensed professional counselor supervisor. And that means that in the state of Texas, I'm responsible toward, to a board that gave me that license. But you also have licensed chemical dependency counselors. Those are LCDCs. You have licensed social workers. So those are your SWs. You have your board of psychologists. And then you have LMFTs, which are marriage and family therapists. Okay. And your grouping deals with what kind of issues? Well, the professional counselors were able to diagnose. We do the counseling part. We can do evalu uh, intakes, assessments, whether that be at a psychiatric hospital or in our own practices. And it's just really the all-encompassing counseling part. 
And it seems like you've got a specialty that people might find very interesting. Yes. Uh, when I started off as an intern back in 1999, I came across my first episode, or I guess a couple of cases of self-injury. And they didn't cover that in graduate school, unfortunately. Uh, so this was sort of my learning curve. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've worked with over, <coughs> over 435 people with the history, either current or past, of intentional self-harm. And so it just became my specialty just because wherever I was working, it became uh, an issue, whether I was working in patient psychiatric or a nonprofit center, uh, outpatient clinic, and of course in private practice. So we're talking about people harming themselves. Are we talking people to try to commit suicide? Or are there other forms of self-harm that you also deal with? Well, there's a correlation between self-injurious behavior, or what we now call non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI for short, versus suicidal ideation. And oftentimes, if people are, say, cutting or harming themselves in other ways, it's the preventative to a suicide attempt. So oftentimes, they have the suicidal thoughts, but when they're doing the behavior of self-injury, it's preventing them from going that next step to actually taking their life. So it's a releaser. Yes. It's, I remember uh, I studied ethology, and they would talk mm -hmm. about specific stimuli creating a behavioral pattern. Yes. And, and, and that, I think they call it the specific action potential. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're dealing with here is people who could have gone into a suicidal mode, yes. but instead they're taking it out on themselves in another way, less mm -hmm. destructive, but nevertheless not good. Yes, and it's one of the things I outline in the book in a caregiver's guide to self-injury, because it's really important to make that distinction between <clears throat> is this a suicide <clears throat> attempt or is this self-injury. Both are concerning. It's not trying to be dismissive of one versus the other, but it's in really important to understand which one you're dealing with, because if you go to a psychiatric hospital or you go to a medical ER, oftentimes they're not trained to differentiate between the two. So they're all the same. It's all the same, and so you're going to be treated as if you attempted suicide. Which is very versus, bad. Yeah, it's a whole That's different That's not a fun thing. experience. No. You know, I studied psychology, and I know when somebody has that kind of thing, they lose their personal freedom, and, mm -hmm. and basically they're, they're locked up. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it does go to an involuntary thing. Um, it's just your... It, to quickly put, you are treated differently. You're triaged differently. And self-injury can be treated on an outpatient basis. Right. Uh, some cases do go to the level where you do need uh, inpatient treatment because it's such severe self-injury. But usually in those <clears throat> cases, you also have very active suicidal thoughts too. Interesting. So how do you distinguish between the two? How do you know when somebody is suicidal or somebody is just mm -hmm. acting out through self -injury. What would be some of the symptoms or things you would look at? It's a great <clears throat> question. So when I differentiate, I always want to know intent. What was the intent behind mm. the act? Because people that self-harm, they can be very clear in saying, I was angry, I was sad, I was really frustrated, I felt like I needed to punish myself, I felt guilty. It, I mean, there's a list of... 35 different reasons why people self-harm. But these the are the book. conscious ones, right? These are, and most times it is very conscious of, I know I'm about to take this lighter, this blade, this whatever instrument and inflict pain on my body and I'm intentionally doing it. But my intent is to just have the pain or to have that emotional release. My intent is not to die. Is the intent to punish themselves in some way? Well, that's one of the reasons that comes up out of the 35, is that if they are, let's say, a perfectionist, and oftentimes we can't live up to our high levels of uh, grandiosity, these <laughs> right. unrealistic uh, goals of ours, and when we don't attain those or consistently attain it, then perfectionists may feel the need to punish themselves. I failed myself, and maybe they're slapping themselves as they're doing it, and I know of different cases uh, where it 
adult. Maybe they had a parent that was stern or strict or a nun in a, in a, in a, in a strict environment mm -hmm. that punished them. And now they're doing it to themselves as, as, a, as a form of p punishment for something they failed to accomplish. It's one of the factors, but to be clear, parents aren't fully to blame. No? It, it, they're, they're not. <laughs> I thought in psychology it's all your mother's fault. It's all fault. about the parents. <laughs> and it, it really, it's, it's not always about the parents. Um, because one of the top reasons why people self-injure, if you were to look at history of abuse, about 70% of the cases, because I do my own research and chart my clients, 70% of them was emotional abuse. And with that, bullying falls into mm. play. Mm. So you have the social aspect that is just as important as whatever the home environment may be. But how parents respond to the self-injury, now that can make a huge difference as to whether they exacerbate the behavior or they help it in mm. treatment. Interesting. But adults do self-injure, and to be clear about that, that does happen. Sometimes Is it common? It, it, it's hit and miss on that because a lot of adults don't talk about it, and a lot of times when adults <clears throat> go into treatment, counselors and psychiatrists and other practitioners aren't assessing for it because there's this assumption you're an adult. Self-injury is for teenagers. Are there forms of depression where they're not physically abusing themselves but emotionally? They're castrating themselves or holding themselves back or punishing themselves through a depression state or uh, anxiety state. Is that, is that a form of, of self-affliction? Well, there's, I outlined 19 different forms of self-harm in okay. the book. And a lot of people is have no idea. The <laughs> <laughs> in some cases, probably, yes. I um, tell you when my first marriage was a storybook marriage. Unfortunately, Stephen King wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happily married now, and we are friends. It's just, but yeah, I guess in some cases it could be a form of abuse. <laughs> in some cases, yes, and yeah, bad relationships are a factor as to why someone may. Uh, you think people actually do that as a as a way of punishment? I'm not speaking of myself right now, but you think it's possible that someone might choose a poor partner as a form of self abuse to well, hurt themselves? There's the self-sabotage. I mean, people do things okay. to sabotage themselves all the time, and that goes into stuff I cover more in the second book, A Practitioner's uh, Guide in the Treatment of Self-Injury, okay. where we get into the real nitty-gritty of it, and we get into what I call the core issues. Because if you don't address the core stuff, and you get that foundation set, yeah, you're going to be doomed to continue to have poor boundaries and poor relationships and continue with depression and anxiety right. and anger right, right, right. and... Because you can't just treat the symptoms. No. You have to look at what's bringing those symptoms out. And Absolutely. is that what you do in your, in your counseling? Yes. Yes, we get to the core issues because I sort of paint as a tree. And I'm doing a training at the end of this month for counselors on how to actually treat self-injury. It's based on this book. But we look at it, all these acting out symptoms are sort of like the the dead leaves mm -hmm. on a tree. So you could have perfectionism, eating disorder, self-injury, substance abuse, which but I do. those are the symptoms, not They're the causes. They're all the symptoms. And so you have to get down into the roots of that tree, those core issues. Because until you have a healthy root system, a healthy foundation, what comes up the trunk is going to be flawed. So out of, out of curiosity, I am a psychologist. Out of curiosity, are you taking more of a um, <clears throat> behavioral approach where you modify behavior patterns, like say through hypnosis or um, behavior modification, or is it more of a, of a analysis where you're, you're probing for, for the past and trying to create new re responses to old patterns, or is it a blend of all of that? It's a blend. I really do eclectic kind of counseling is how I think of it. Because I want to go where the client is. Because some clients are going to be very responsive to certain types of therapies, and others are going to be responsive to others. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a counselor, you have to work where your client is at. But overall, I say that I'm, I'm part of the whole BT side of things. So it's cognitive behavioral, it's rational emotive, it's dialectical. It's all these versions of behavioral therapies out there. And it is interactive. I don't sit back and just go, well, tell me what you think of that, because one that feels very right. cliche and I don't think is very effective. 
it's interactive. I'm going to challenge them. I want them to think through okay. things, and they okay. will have assignments. Because I know in some therapeutic environments, it's like, so what do you think? How do you feel? And they don't really um, provide a structure as much mm -hmm. as tell me what you're thinking and feeling. Yeah. And it's more of a dynamic approach where you're not just probing, but you're giving them things to think about and mm -hmm. directions to take to, mm -hmm. to resolve the issue, which is probably more effective. Well, it is when you look at the research, especially dealing with depression and anxiety, consistently research shows that cognitive behavioral therapy or things along that behavioral therapy line, that's the one that's most effective. Interesting. I noticed that tattoos and piercings and body modifications, um, are, are, they, are they always a, a form of self-inflicted pain or can they be more, someone just wants something aesthetic. So how, when, where's the, where's the uh, boundary when you're going from, I'd like a, a little love thing with your name yeah. on my wrist to uh, I'm going to put a stick through my nose <laughs> and, 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 and my tongue. Where, where is that boundary? Where do you call it self-inflicted pain versus yes. uh, say a, a, some sort of a beautification in their mm -hmm. mind? It's a good question because when I started to do training events for the community and for counselors, that's one of the things that would consistently come up, which is why I put in the book, because it's a common question. There are a couple of different caveats to it. So one, you have to go back to intent. What was the intent behind the piercing or the tattoo? There's a difference between, well, I want my mom tattooed because mom's really special to me versus, you know, I'm not really quite sure why I got it. Um, and there's a difference of, I was drunk one night, and I'm not sure what <coughs> happened, but my friends dared me is what I gather. Mm. So again, you have to get to that intent. There's a difference of, when you have a tattoo, oftentimes you would want to show it off. That's an expected response. Versus, I have these piercings, or I have these different marks, and I want to keep it very secretive and oh. to myself. So secrecy can play a part oh. in distinguishing self-harm. What about like Ma Manson when he put the swastika on his forehead? <laughs> he's just a special he's case. He's a, he's, he, he'll, he'll just stay on his special. Yeah. He's, he's special. Yeah, okay. He's very different. But the, I do have some that will, they keep finding excuses to get piercings or tattoos. Okay. They keep finding all these over excuses. And over. They're not having a piercing. They're, it's, like they're, it's like a life calling. You know, their hobby is what piercing am I doing today? Well, it gets to the tent where there are some I've said, it seems like you're switching from cutting into piercing. You're still getting the high. You're still doing it for the same reasons. There's a problem there. And body modifications, what, what are we, we're, not, we're not talking like breast enhancement here, right? Mm -hmm. Are we? Well, it, it's a form of it, so it's a continuum of things. What I focus more on is when you have individuals that have the massive gauges in their ear where, I mean, you could just a shoot a bullet through it. Yeah. Or you have or embedding, <laughs> um, yeah, like really huge holes in there right. or even gauges in their nose. Right. I mean, really transforming their body, uh, implants in, a, like in their a, head. Okay, that would, that would make sense. That makes a lot more, because like you said, like, you know, a lot of women will have their ears pierced to put mm -hmm. on earrings, including you, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily yes. trying to uh, <laughs> uh, cause pain to yourself. Yes. You know, big difference. Okay. So some of the things you look for are signs of injury. So what, what do you, you mentioned a few things. Is it hidden? Is that, is that, a, big, is that a big tell? Yes. Oftentimes it's a secretive behavior. They... They're ashamed of it. They're embarrassed. They don't want to answer the questions. They don't want to be forced into counseling. That mm. they will keep it to themselves. And in those cases, you want to look for, well, are there any missing items in the kitchen? Are there missing knives? You know, if you're putting away their laundry and you go, okay, where did this little blade come from? Where is their X-Acto knife here? Why are there bandages, a lot more bandages in the trash can than yeah. usual? Why am I finding blood splatters on towels or on sheets? 
why are they spending <clears throat> much more time in the bathroom and I'm not really hearing anything going on okay. in there. Are you listening? <laughs> well, I mean, sort of like walking by, you know, there's some things you just go, something yeah. seems it's odd. It's been four hours, but maybe yeah. there's something wrong. <laughs> Either they drank, drank a pint of laxative or uh, something else. Well, good. yeah. And, <laughs> but the final, You're getting ready for colonoscopy. <laughs> yes. And one would hope that <laughs> Sorry, you avoid to do those as much as possible. Uh, yes, those you are do. Just, uh, I don't call that, that self-inflicted. That's the doctor having a little sadistic time. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that's interesting. So... Uh, this is this clothing that also has to do with this? What, mm -hmm. what kind of clothing would you look for? What might be a tell? Well, clothing can be indicative of it. So you see a changing, a change in clothing style. To mask. To mask it. And long ago, before they were in vogue or clothiers made them this way, you had what's called thumbhole shirts. And so it's a long sleeve, and they would cut a hole so it'd fit over the thumb. Really? The reason being is if they have injuries on their forearm, if you're reaching across the table, your arm or the I've sleeve goes up. I've never heard of that. So then it exposes them. So if they <clears throat> can cut a hole in their clothing, to, then when they reach out their arm, the sleeve stays it, down. Almost like an addict trying to hide their... Uh, yes, their, their track marks. Is, is, is addiction also a form of, of this? Is, there, is, there a, a, is that a component of some of this? Are they intermingled as, as, as illnesses at some time? Yes, there, I do think substance use is correlated. It's not an absolute, it's not causation, but oftentimes we see these connections of eating disorders and self-injury and substance abuse and self-injury. It's not absolute, because I have plenty of people that have never had either one of those, but that's where you can get to flip-flopping behaviors that if you only deal with the symptom okay, great, they're not self-injuring, but now they've moved on to substance use, or now they've moved to eating disorder because you didn't get to the core. And in the practitioner's guide, all of Chapter 3 is laying out how self-injury really should be considered an addiction. <coughs> oh. And a lot of people haven't thought of it, it in compulsive? those terms. Is it a compulsive behavior? It can be very compulsive. And just like with substance, some people can have oh. X number of drinks. They can do whatever. It's contained. It's all good. Some people that self-injure may never become addicted to it. You don't know when that time's going to be, when it slips into addiction, but I've had plenty of people that say, I am addicted to self-injury. Mm. And the parallels <clears throat> between substance and it are, are so there. Uh, from what I was listening, you were pointing out, someone may find out in the laundry there's blades mm -hmm. and stuff. Okay, so now they're not the person with the problem, it might be a parent that's finding out about mm -hmm. a, uh, either a, a maid or one of the children, let's say. Um, wouldn't it be much more difficult to treat someone who isn't coming to you because they want the help, but the yes. family is saying they need the help? How, mm -hmm. how do you deal with someone who needs the help, but doesn't want to acknowledge that they need the mm -hmm. help? And how often is that the case versus they come for the help? You know, it's sort of a, a mixed thing because there are some that will, it gets discovered, if you will, because it seems like it's attention-seeking behavior. And that's one of the mistakes that I tell parents to avoid. Don't say you're doing this for attention because you will shut down the person. Mm. There are some, I think, that they've gotten so tired of trying to hide it that they just sort of let it start to slip out and they don't work as hard to cover the Do they injuries. want to be found? Is it like yeah, almost like... Yeah, at some level they, they're doing <clears throat> it because it, they want the help, but they have some kind of internal belief of, I can't ask for it, I can't initiate <clears throat> it, but if it gets accidentally discovered, I'm okay with it and sort of relieved. There are some people that, that do it, maybe on the attention side, but that's a whole other can of worms that we get into. But if parents suspect it, and if they think that, you know, this is going on or they're being told by maybe their child's friend or maybe a colleague or someone, then they, one, need to know how to approach that person. There are to-dos and not to-dos that I outline. Mm. But you want to make sure you're in a good place with it. That you have you're to be somewhat, strong. You, you have to be, be strong. You have to be <clears throat> educated. And then you're probably going to want to go ahead and consult someone that is experienced in working with this <clears throat> to know exactly what should we do, how do we lay this out, what kind of environment, because it's in a way going to be an intervention. What kind of mistakes a person might make as a caretaker and not realize they're doing it? 
Well, the cover of the book outlines the typical thing that I've come across. So you have the dad that reacts more with anger. He's just like, oh, I can't believe that you're doing this. I just, what are you thinking? And then you have the mom that's just almost in histrionics, like, oh my gosh, it's my baby, and I can't believe they're doing this. <laughs> and that's why and, they're doing it. <laughs> either response is going to be terrible for that kid because on the one side, the kid's going, oh, see, I'm, I'm a bad kid, and I made my mom cry, and I'm really horrible, and it just reinforces all that negative self-talk. <clears throat> and then it's the... Well, you know, I'm doing it because you're such a jerk dad, and if you weren't this way, then maybe I wouldn't have a reason to do it. So it, you have a shutdown in communication. Is this often younger people that are doing this, or do you find this is a problem among older people as well? One of the myths out there is that this is only a teenage girl thing, and I've had cases that started in early elementary school, and I've had ones that go into their 50s. Interesting. It's across the lifespan. So if people would like to reach you, could we put her contact information for Lori, Lori Van on, on the screen? Um, Lori is available as a counselor. If you mm -hmm. have questions, you can call at 214, I can't read, it's 270-6966? Yes, 6966. 6966, mm -hmm. that's cool, that's easy to remember. Uh, and Lori at Lori Van, V-A-N-N dot -N com. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and people are looking for help or if they know someone who needs mm -hmm. help, they could call you. Also, if you'd like to get her books. She has books. She has, is the, these are uh, recordings. Yes. Uh, the second book is a CD because it's so much material that it's about eight hours of information. And you said that's for professionals, too. It's geared much, much more for mental health practitioners. So now you know how to reach her. Give her a call at 214-270-0696. I can't see. I have like these Verilux oh. <laughs> lenses and I'm looking at the distance to read. You're supposed to read close. Yes. <laughs> and Lori at LoriVan.com. And if you'd like to get some help from me, you could go to HBSpeedReading.com for reading, writing, memory and, health, um, memory and math skills. If you have a youngster that needs help at school or wants to excel, maybe they're getting ready for college. Maybe you have a senior in your home and you'd like to see them stay mentally fit as they grow older. Reading is one of the best things they can do to stay mentally fit. Or maybe you're in business and there's so much information you need to know and not enough time to learn it. HBSpeedReading.com. That's my phone, 214-952-9150. I provide it to anyone getting my programs. They offer personal help. I don't charge for that. I want you to learn the programs when you buy them. And... If you have an idea for a show, or maybe you'd like to be a guest on a show, give me a call or email me at Mr. Reader, M R R E A D E R, at MSN.com. So that's HBSpeedReading.com, Mr. Reader at MSN.com, or 214 952 9150. Anyway, you'll be able to reach me for help and get my programs. Till next time, this is Howard Berg wishing you and yours the best. Of success. See you next time. That's it. The truth sets you free. With the world's fastest reader, Howard Stevenberg.